Good morning, I'm Philippe Gentil. I work at InnerVision Women's Ultrasound in Nashville, Tennessee. And this morning I will talk to you about tumors in the fetus. Good morning. In this presentation, I'm going to show a lecture that was presented, that was prepared uh, by my fellow Irina Tihorenko. Uh, she is a physician from Belarus, and she came to visit our uh, place several years ago, and we have worked on this lecture jointly. Uh, when she started doing this lecture on tumors, I had no real consideration for how big this was going to be, and so in this segment here, I will just talk to you about brain tumors, and if I have time, I will go on and talk about facial tumors. So let's start with brain tumors. And uh, brain tumors can arise from essentially three uh, type of lesion. Intracranial tumors, lipoma of the corpus callosum, which is more a birth defect than a real tumor, and then vascular anomaly. Overall, if you take any brain mass, the outcome is not very good. About only 28% of these babies survive. And the findings are not going to be very precise. Usually we'll find a mass, which is either cystic, solid, or heterogeneous. We'll find alteration of the shape and size of the brain, or part of the brain. We'll see a loss of the normal intracranial architecture. We may see microcephaly, or sometimes, but less common, microcephaly. And quite commonly, there will be alteration of the swelling of fluid, and those babies will develop polyhydramias. The associated malformations are essentially, I believe, just random. Uh, cleft lip and cleft pad have been associated, cardiac anomaly, urine tract anomaly, but I don't believe these are true association. I believe these are just random uh, reports in the literature. Now, the outcome is difficult to predict because we don't have the histology of the lesion, so we'll try our best to try to guess what of the, which of the brain tumor we're looking at, and the outcome is, of course, going to depend on size, location, the histology, the fact that the tumor can be resected or not, and the condition of the fetus at the time of diagnosis. So, for the very large tumor in which we don't still have the histology, very much a good a reasonable prognosis can be obtained simply because of the size, location, and these criteria. Neonates that have a choroid plexus papilloma, ganglioma, or low-grade astrocytoma are those that have the best prognosis, whereas those that have teratoma or the primitive neuroectodermal tumors that we refer to as PNET tumors have the worst prognosis. So let's start with the brain neoplasm. And brain neoplasm essentially arise from two main types of cells, the glia, and therefore there will be gliomas, such as the astrocytes and the oligodendrocyte, or the ependymental cells, which will result in ependymomas. There are also some primitive neuroctodermal cells that have been left over and somehow develop into tumors. There are also some pineal parenchyma, choroid plexus, and all these are quite common. And then there will be some neuroepithelial uh, tumors of uncertain origin. And then, of course, there will be mixed tumors. So uh, essentially a great variation here, but mostly glial uh, and ependymal uh, tumors. And these are some of the common tumors, the teratoma, intracranial germ cell tumor, glioblastoma, ganglioneuroma, astrocytoma, choroplexus papilloma, craniopharyngioma, hemangiopericytoma, and we'll see some of each. And then the PNET tumor, the neuroectodermal tumor that are presented by this group over here. Now, this may look like a very frightening list of, of anomaly, but I would like to make an analogy here with the fetal echo. I don't know if you remember the situation, but 15 years ago when we were looking at fetal heart and something was not normal, the report usually said complex congenital heart disease. And I don't think anyone wants to put a complex congenital heart disease report anymore. We want to be more precise than that. And I think that this is probably the level we are at with the brain neoplasm. It is not sufficient to say that the baby has a brain tumor. You want to be a bit more precise than that. This is the frequency distribution, and you see that choroid plexus papilloma is the most common, although they are quite rarely reported. Teratomas, astrocytoma, 
medulloblastoma, and so on and so forth. And let's start with the intracranial germ cell tumors. This is 0.4 to 3% of all intracranial tumors. They will present as a mass around the third ventricle. And these are tissue of germ cell origin that will, in fetal disease, be mostly teratoma, but can be other type of tumors in older patients, including germinoma, embryonic cell carcinoma, and so on and so forth. But in fetuses, we're talking mostly about teratoma. The complication of these tumors will be compression and obstruction of the uh, CS CSF uh, flow, and this is going to lead to hydrocephalus. So remember, teratoma in the brain will cause uh, hydrocephalus. And of course, the prognosis is quite poor for these tumors. This is now the next condition, the choroid plexus papilloma. This is one of the most common uh, tumors. It is a benign tumor of the choroid plexus. It presents with enlarged and irregularly hyperechoic choroid plexus. And you can see here an example. This is the enlarged choroid plexus. You can see it over here invading into uh, the third ventricle and uh, the treatment will be surgery. Now notice that this image here is not very striking. This is a tumor, this is not a normal image, and we should not have this vascularization at this level. These are four more images in other cases, also from Gustavo Meninger. You see what appears to be a cast of the ventricle over here, a cast over here, and this. These are the typical form of plexus papilloma, and they're easy to miss, so I would like to alert you to recognize them. This is a slightly different form with a cystic appearance of the choriplexus papilloma, but that also is a choriplexus papilloma. Here, as you can see on the video clip, the choriplexus look rather normal, but they are way more bulky than they should be, and there is extra vascularization inside the uh, tumor. So that is really the finding that you may want to pay attention to, this bulky, polylabulated choroid plexus that look bigger than normal, but otherwise the texture of it is not very different. A teratoma, as you remember, is a tumor that has all three germ cell layer. So it has an ectoderm, it has the endoderm, and it has the mesoderm. And because of that, we can clearly expect that these are going to be tumors that are irregular in texture, they will contain some cystic lesion, they will contain some solid lesion, and they probably will have some calcification. And here is the uh, most classical appearance of a cystic teratoma of the brain. You see a complete loss of normal brain architecture. The uh, tumor is full with cysts, and those cysts are probably secreting uh, choroid plexus uh, fluid. There's some calcification, there's some shadowing, and essentially nothing of the brain is visible. And not only that, but the baby has a very severe microcrania. If I can read properly, the bipartial diameter here was 120. And remember that at birth it should be around 95, 97. So this is a baby that has to have either a craniosynthesis or will have to have a season section. And the prognosis, of course, for such a lesion is fatal. The findings will be an heterogeneous mass with loss of brain architecture, unrecognizable midline, ector, uh, midline echo, ventricular meningitis, and calcification. This is a case from Gianluigi Pidu, a little bit less severe than the one I just showed you. There's still a little bit of architecture that is visible, but essentially the brain has been entirely replaced. These have a very rapid growth, and sometimes there is some bleeding inside the tumor that uh, cause some uh, change that are visible over a couple of days. Because of the bleeding and because of the shunting inside the lesion, they will have high output cardiac failure, and this is going to lead to polyhydramias. And they will also have uh, pulmonary hyperplasia, all these involving premature delivery, and these are the complications uh, that may occur. The tumor tumor are frequently located in the third ventricle in the subfrontal region, or in the subtemporal area. This is a quite different form of teratoma, 
And I would like you to burn this image in your mind because I'll show you cranial pharyngeoma in just a second. And you see the cranial pharyngeoma look very much like this, but this one has a bit more irregular texture. And here you can see the teratoma at this level. This is another teratoma, and as you can see, the growth of the intracranial tumor is deforming the face here. This is pushing the eye, and uh, you'll see that rhabdomyosarcoma can also look like that, but the rhabdomyosarcoma does not involve the whole brain, just the, uh, uh, the eye and the neck and the face. The complication will be ventricle dilatation with malformation and obstruction, hydrocephalus, microcephaly, spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage in up to 20% of the case, and dystocia during delivery. The differential diagnosis will be cranial pharyngeoma. I'll show you one very soon. The crape plexus papilloma, and we've seen that much less uh, severe. Arachnoid cyst, which will be predominantly cystic and will be uh, mostly on the posterior fossa and the fetus, vascular malformation, infarction, and uh, hemorrhages. The prognosis is fatal in all those cases, but in rare cases, it may depend on the grade of the tumor, tumor, the size, the location of the tumor, and its consequence on the remaining brain. So from time to time, some of the small tumor, tumor can be removed, but usually death may occur in utero. The management is to decompress the head by doing repeated syphilis or a termination of pregnancy. This is another example in which part of the brain is still rather well seen, but there's this large mass that is compressing and expanding the head. Uh, another teratoma, and this is the appearance of the newborn after birth and the lesion and the pathology of the lesion. So a very uh, large, fast-growing tumor. Glioblastoma is 2 to 9% of gonadal brain tumor, so not very common. It will present as a hypergraic mass around the third ventricle, and on cardioplar, they are very vascular. The differential diagnosis will be the teratoma that appears multicystic, vascular malformation, infarction, and hemorrhage. The complication of glioblastoma is that they can cause some spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage, heart failure, and anemia, and the prognosis is poor due to the rapid growth of the tumor. The next tumor is ganglioneuroma. These are also called gangliocytoma, and these are tumors of mature neuronal elements, so they will have a more benign outcome. These are not common, 0.4 to 3.8 percent of all intracranial tumors, and they will be either in the spinal cord, in about half of the case, the cerebral hemisphere in about a third of the case, and then the brain stem, and rarely in the cellar region, when we want to differentiate them with the cranial pharyngeoma, cerebellum, and the pineal gland. The treatment would be to shun those babies with, uh, after delivery and provide chemotherapy in, in an effort to shrink the mass prior to surgery. The prognosis is uh, with complete removal of the tumor. Uh, the baby may also have, even when the tumor is completely removed, issue of hormonal hypersecretory syndromes, and that is going to complicate the management of those children. This is an example of a ganglioneuroma uh, that was in the posterior fossa and was associated with Fanconi's anemia. So most of what you see on the image, aside from the tumor, is large bleed in the ventricle, but those bleeds were not related to the ganglioneuroma. They were related to a Fanconi's anemia and some uh, bleeding in the brain. Here is the bleed and the tumor. The next lesion is astrocytoma, and these are not very common. They are neuroectodermal uh, uh, lesions. They occur in 0 0.03 to 0 0.01 per 10,000 deliveries, so not likely to recognize many of them. They represent 13% of all congenital brain, brain tumor and 20% of all glioma. They affect boys and girls at the same level. And here's an example of one. As you can see, this is a polylobulated very dense echogenic lesion, but it has some hypoechoic uh, area inside and maybe a few specks of calcification. Pathogenesis is unknown, uh, maybe some physical element, like x-ray, chemical, or viral factor. The associated anomaly will be 
obstructive hydrocephalus resulting from compression of the uh, ventricular system, and the prognosis will depend on its operability. The next is craniopharyngeoma, and that is a common uh, disorder that you are likely to encounter. These are benign midline supracellar tumor that contain fat, calcification, and cystic component. And when they're lethal, it is lethal due to the extension and growth. They represent about 2 to 5 percent of the intracranial tumor and 50 percent of the supracellar tumor in children. And girls are slightly more commonly affected than boys. These are supposed to arise from Radke's pouch, which is an ectodermal diverticulum. Remember, this is the roof of the mouth. This is an ectodermal diverticulum that is developing towards the brain. And there are several forms, but I don't think that we can recognize the different forms prenatally. The findings will be quite easy to recognize. Here we have a potato-like, uh, polylobulated, smooth icogenicity mass that is located straight over the cella. And uh, very interestingly, this uh, lesion will have to develop for a long time before it starts affecting the ventricles. So the uh, hydrocephalus may occur, but it is often a late development. Of course, from its position, you will see some uh, displacement of the circle of Willis, and uh, that is one of the criteria that helps look at the, uh, the lesion. This is the same baby 12 days later. You see that the mass has grown quite significantly in 12 days, and the baby was delivered, and this is the two-month-old CT. And you see the origin here over the sphenoid. The baby is facing in this direction. And this is the uh, brain that has been flattened uh, towards the top, and this baby died a couple of days after the uh, exam was obtained. Another very similar uh, image from uh, Luc Duquette in Belgium here. You see the mass with the same contour, the same ecogenicity. They tend to be quite smooth. And if you look at the saddle view, here it is just located above the sphenoid and displacing the brain upwards. That's the reason you don't get hydrocephalus rapidly. It's also the reason that this lesion is quite central, which helps differentiate it from the astrocytoma that we were looking at in the previous uh, set of slides. The differential diagnoses include teratoma, astrocytoma, optic uh, chiasma, glioma, hypothalamic glioma, a PNET, lipoma of the corpus callosum, but they're usually higher in the brain and intracranial bleed. None of this tumor, except for astrocytoma, really look very much like craniopharyngioma. So that differential diagnosis is a very wide differential diagnosis. The prognosis is very poor because they grow very rapidly. It's only the very small one that can uh, uh, be operated. And the management is to uh, terminate the pregnancy uh, when they are discovered. Even with complete resection, there is a risk of recurrence that is 7%. So this is a tumor that comes back. And remember, it was a benign lesion originally. Another example of craniopharyngioma, a very midline lesion that is well-centered. It is located just above uh, the uh, pineal region uh, with displacement of the flow and not very many vessels inside. That is quite typical of craniopharyngioma. Image of uh, pericytoma, this is a tumor of the arachnoid membranes. And because of that, you can expect that this is going to be a tumor that grows from the periphery towards the center of the brain. And so it will be an asymmetrical tumor. Uh, that tumor usually has very poor prognosis. This is the Doppler uh, flow of this uh, lesion, which is vascular and displacing the adjacent vessel. And the uh, MRI that shows the compression of the brain, displacement of the brain. This is the lesion under the brain. You see part of the membranes. And this is the cut section with the histology of the uh, hemangiopericytoma. Neuroectodermal tumors, these are uh, tumors that are central or peripheral uh, nervous system. You can have the two types. These are soft tissue sarcoma that arise from primitive and undifferentiated nerve cells that have been left over during the development of the nervous system. The synonyms are the PNAT, which is probably easiest to pronounce, uh, peripheral neuroepithelioma, peripheral neuroblastoma, askin tumor, and the old uh, extraosseous ewing sarcoma. 
The prevalence, this is a rare tumor, but they represent 30% of all solid brain tumor. Uh, overall, they affect 0.05 per 10,000 children. There's a slightly higher incidence in Caucasian than in black, and there's a slightly higher preponderance among boys than girls, 1.8 over 1. The P-net can be divided into two forms, the central P-net and the peripheral P-net. The central P-net are themselves divided into a supratentorial, and uh, for instance, the pineoblastoma is a supratentorial form, or the infratentorial, such as the medulloblastoma. And here is a list of the most common uh, neurotidermal tumors that you're likely to encounter. This is one from Brian Bromley. This is one that was originating in the uh, pons and the cerebellum and caused some four ventricle uh, hemorrhage and also bilateral germinal matrix hemorrhage. So here the tumor is not very big but has caused some bleeding that uh, enlarges its effect. The treatment would be surgery, radiation therapy, and chemotherapy, and some of those uh, can be uh, taken care of. Ependymoma, a glial tumor that originate in the ventricle space or from residual intraparenchymal uh, ependymal cells, and they are divided into two-thirds in the posterior fossa and one-third in the uh, uh, supratentorial region. And that one-third in the supratentorial region is divided almost evenly among the lesion in the parenchyma and the lesion in the ventricular system. And here we have the uh, image of this ependymoma. Here the criteria is that this will be asymmetrical lesion, but that tend to uh, arise into the ventricle, and so there will be some connection with the ventricle to the tumor. Here I see the polylobulated appearance, uh, rather homogeneous, but it has some speckles of calcification and some little cystic area inside them. The prevalence is 69% of the primary central nervous system neoplasm, 69% of all neuropathial tumor, 6-12% of brain tumor in children, and ependymoma may recur even after surgery. Lipoma of the corpus callosum, a lipoma of the corpus callosum is actually not a tumor, it is mostly a brain malformation, and as you can see, it occurs mostly at the level of the genu of the corpus callosum. However, this is a great mimicker because it can involve the lateral ventricle, and then it will look very much like a choroid plexus papilloma. Uh, this is not a common finding, 0 0.04 to 0 0.4 per 10,000 autopsy. They are hyperechoic and homogeneous, and they're often in the genu of the corpus callosum. And here's another example. This is the most typical form, a bright mass located straight at the level of the genu of the corpus callosum. When it is Limited to this, the diagnosis is, is not very difficult. But sometimes it involves also the lateral ventricle, and here it is a bit harder to recognize as being a lipoma or the corpus callosum. Here's another example. You can see the invasion that looks very much like the choroid plexus papilloma. Uh, but here on the pathology segment, you can see the origin here in the genu, the extension in the ventricle, and very clearly when you do the path, even I can see that this is a lipoma and you see all the fat lobules that have been dissolved during the processing. Let's go on. We have seen the intracranial tumor and the lipoma. Now let's go into the vascular anomaly and we'll talk about the hemorrhages, the arteriovenous anomalies and the vein of Galen uh, varix. Now, intracranial hemorrhage are uncommon. They are divided very clearly in newborns, and we have just used the same uh, division and same terminology into a grade one through four. Grade one representing preventricular hemorrhage confined to both ventricle, both germinal matrix. In grade two and three, the hemorrhage has extended into the ventricle, and in grade three, it has caused a dilatation of the ventricle in grade four, there's extension to the adjacent white matter. This is a very large grade four um, hemorrhage with a large invasion of the white matter. This was a baby that had a 
bleed after a twin to twin transfusion syndrome. This is a large cystic mass. This is a great big arterial venous uh, malformation. This is not the vein of Gillian Varix that we'll see in just a second. This is just a large pool of blood with one feeding artery and draining artery. And babies that have that typically will have a local mass effect. They will have hemodynamic effect, in particular ventricular hypertrophy and poor contractility. They will have atrioventricular regurgitation, umbilical venous pulsation that radiate to the placenta, and there will be uh, cardiac output and hydro, uh, cardiac output issues and hydrospatitis. The differential diagnosis will be hemangioma, Kaposi hemangioendothelioma, angioblastoma, angiosarcoma, congenital hemangioparasitoma that we saw earlier, and arteriovenous fistula. And Doppler here helps narrow the diagnosis because you can see this particularly large amount of vessel inside the tumor. There will be some maternal complications, including the mirror syndrome, the Ballantine syndrome, with maternal oliguria, mild elevation of the blood pressure, and minimal proteinuria with elevation of the uric acid level. And the other uh, syndrome that can occur is the Kazabak Merritt syndrome with disseminated intravascular coagulation. The next condition is the vein of Galen Varix. This is not a tumor, this is just a space occupying lesion. And this is the cystic appearance that we typically uh, see with this. Of course, this could represent a arachnoid cyst, but as soon as we put Doppler, the differential diagnosis is established. Okay, this is what I wanted to show you about the brain. Let me show you a few tumor of the face. And uh, these are the lesions that we're going to be uh, covering. The epulis is a rather common uh, lesion. It is a pedunculated tumor of the anterior gingiva. It's also called granular cell myoblastoma. And this is, although a rare condition, it is something easy to recognize prenatally, so they tend to be seen fairly well. Uh, it occurs in the second trimester. You see the nice smooth border. You see that it attached to the upper gums. The finding will be a solid intraoral mass protruding out. It is well circumscribed. It is homogeneous. There may be classification in a cystic component, but that is not very prevalent, and they will increase in size as gestation develops, but still keep the well circumscribed uh, appearance. On color doppler, there is no particular feature, uh, but it's useful to differentiate from hemangioma. It may have a single uh, feeding vessel. And there's some interesting, uh, intriguing idea of using Cardoppler to assess the patency of the nose during breathing. You know that you can see flow through the nostrils and the mouth when babies are breathing, and it is interesting to see whether the epulis is uh, causing some uh, trouble with that. And 3D ultrasound is useful to see the overall appearance and to uh, reassure the parents about what it looks like. However, notice that on this uh, 3D, there is the sensation that this lesion is actually cystic. That is an artifact of the 3D rendering. This, is, this lesion is not cystic, it is solid. And you can see on the 2D of the same baby that this is really a solid lesion. If it was cystic, of course, you're thinking about ranula, and we'll talk about ranula in just a second. If you have access to MRI, you can confirm the presence of the upper airways and confirm that the upper airways are not obstructed. When the baby is born, uh, the complication will be polyhydramnios, respiratory obstruction, postnatally asphyxia due to airway obstruction. Uh, and if you see an intracranial extension, think mostly of epignatus. When the baby is born, what you do is uh, an exit procedure if there's suspicion of uh, breathing problem, but otherwise you just surgically resect the lesion as soon as the baby arrives. And this is how that is done. The baby is placed here. There's some local anesthesia. A clamp is placed. The mass is ligated. And uh, the baby can go on to the nursery. And this is the solid mass and the appearance in pathology. Another example here from Serbia, from Dr. Novakov. You can see this mass here, exactly the same as on the previous exam. The same here on the MRI and the same appearance on the 3D ultrasound. 
the baby is born, the mass is ligated and resected, and the outcome is quite good. There's a long differential diagnosis here, and that differential diagnosis is a bit academic, I would say. A hemangioma, mesenchymal sarcoma, cystic hygroma don't really look like this. Cephalocele's granular cell myoblastoma, that is the same condition, this is just a different name. Neurotidone tumor, thyroglossal duct cyst, branch of cleft cyst, both are very cystic. Anterior meningocele, that is uh, quite different, we'll see them later on. Rhabdomyoma, neck teratoma, we'll see some. Uh, they look more like the uh, epignitis, fibroma, epignitis, mucosele, ranula. That looks like epulis, but they are cystic, and the disontogenesis, genetic cyst. So that long list is probably a bit longer than it really ought to be. The big differential diagnosis, of course, is with epignitis. And here we have this baby that has this very large mass. And you see from the onset that it is much larger, that it has irregular surface, it has irregular contours, and uh, the uh, texture is not as smooth as the previous one. And that, of course, is due to the fact that these are teratoma due to all three germ layers, so you can have any kind of tissue inside that. Now, the epignatus is a teratoma that originated from the facial bones, in particular the heart pad, the sphenoid, and the ethmoid. And that is an important clue because by originating from these three bones, what you will see is not only an invasion of the mouth, but there is a potential for an invasion into the brain, and of course that severely affects the prognosis. Again, a rare condition, but easy to recognize prenatally. The finding will be a solid tumor arising from the oral cavity with calcification and cystic component that are present, and there may be an intracranial extension, and there will be polyhydramias due to pharyngeal obstruction. Here's an example. The baby's head is over here, and there is an ill-defined, polylobulated, heterogeneous mass. Notice that this, in this baby, the heart pad is well-preserved, and there's no extension into the brain. Big mass over here. Quite different from the epulis that we were looking at a second ago. On this other baby here, this mass could look like an epulis, although it is quite large for an epulis. But you see on the other section from the same baby that the mass is irregular, it has some little level echoes, it has some little cystic area, it has some uh, calcification, and a fair amount of vascularization, vascularization. So this is most likely an epignathus. And the 3D rendering is the typical broccoli or cauliflower image with this big polylobulated mass in front of the baby's face. Same as in epignatus, the lesion is uh, resected as soon as the baby is born, and the outcome is uh, tend to be fav favorable when it does not involve the brain. Here you can see the mass and the cross-section of the mass. You see that it is not as smooth as the one we saw when we're talking about the apulis. The prognosis is going to depend on the size, the degree of airway obstruction, death may occur after birth due to asphyxia because of airway obstruction, and the res surgical resection uh, may uh, allow a normal post-operative course in some cases. The differential diagnosis is that same list as we saw for epulis, but you see the texture is a bit different, and so it will uh, have some uh, slight difference in the way the differential diagnosis are taken into account. The complication is that they may grow into the oral and nasal cavity or intracranially, and there will be polyhydramias, which is associated with poor prognosis. This is another epignatus of the mandible this time. You see the same type of lesion, but look at the face over here, and mostly visible on the 3D rendering. This is not arising from the top of the mouth. This is rising from the bottom of the mouth. This is from the mandible, and this is confirmed after birth. This, the baby is being intubated over here. You see this big lesion, and when the lesion was resected, part of the mandible had to be resected. So this baby has a gap that will require some repair later on. Now, if the uh, teratoma is not originating from the mouth, then it is just a regular facial teratoma, 
And here's an example ar arising from the zygomatic arch. You see this big facial heterogeneous mass with calcification, and it arises from the side of the baby's uh, face. And here you can see the appearance when the baby is born. This is the same type of lesion simply arising from a different bone. This is a benign condition. This is a hematoma of the mandible. And you see this baby has this appearance of a large beard or large uh, potato shape uh, lesion arising underneath the, uh, the mandible. And uh, this is the appearance of the baby after birth. You can see this large lesion and the reconstruction several months later. Aranula is a benign condition. This is a cystic malformation of the oral cavity due to obstruction of the sublingual or minor salivary gland. It's also called a retention cyst, a mucosal, or an oral pseudocyst. And the finding here will be like the baby blowing a gigantic bubble gum full of fluid instead of full of air, and uh, it will not have vascularization, and that is the big criteria that differentiated from the other mass we have seen up to now. Prognosis is very good. Rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, I uh, briefly mentioned this earlier when we were talking about the uh, teratoma of the face. This is a common and highly malignant sarcoma of the primitive muscle cells, and they can be located in different region, region of the body. They can be around the head and neck, around the eyes in particular, in 35 to 40 percent, 20 percent in the genitourinary tract, 20 percent in the extremities, and then 10 to 15 percent in the chest and lung region. So the eye is the common lesion. And there are four types, and we don't need to worry about that. The only uh, version we can see prenatally is the embryonal form of rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, which is the most common and occurs uh, also in the head, neck, and genitourinary tract. And this is the appearance. You see this is very similar to what we saw with the teratoma early on, a big mass that is pushing the ocular globe in front and giving this odd appearance to this uh, a poor little child. You can see here the, uh, the video clip with the mass pushing the uh, eye forward. And since this is a very malignant lesion, the prognosis is fatal. Now, of course, the fellow seals are usually easy to trace back to the brain, but sometimes the ethmoidal and the sphenoidal cephalo seals uh, may present as facial tumors. And then you want to look for signs of hydrocephalus and microcephaly in order to help in the diagnosis. Here, for instance, we have an ill-defined mass in the uh, mid-face, and there is the appearance of a cystic lesion inside the mouth of the baby with something protruding over here. When you look at the video clip, it appears that the baby has a great big cyst there, but that cyst, this is the eye, that cyst is not the mouth that is open. See that? appears to be an open mouth, but it's actually a cystic lesion inside the mouth, and this is the appearance of that anterior cephalocele. Another baby that has clearly a lipoma of the corpus callosum, but it also has some frontal bussing, which we have seen before, and you see the head is protruding over here, and on the 3D reconstruction you see that part of the brain is pushed forward this is the typical form of anterocephalocele. This is a more complicated, uh, more complicated lesion. There is a mass here between the eyes and the nose that is pushing here. That mass is solid. It is not cystic as we will see in the decreocystocele in just a second. And you see this mass is protruding above the nose and in front of the eyes. That is another form of cephalocele. You can see it over here after delivery of the child. The differential diagnosis for that, if it was cystic and not solid, would be a dacryocystocele. And dacryocystocele are obstruction of the lacrimal duct at the level of the valve of Hasner over here. Remember that baby opened their eyes around the 28th week, and from then on they're blinking, and when they blink, they push some of the amniotic fluid down the lacrimal duct, and that keeps it patent. But if the patency has not been established over here, then there is no uh, outlet for these uh, tears of amniotic fluid, and uh, they accumulate in this region, and the uh, soft tissue in front of the lacrimal duct are very 
uh, compliant, and so there is a progressive formation of a little cyst uh, in this region. And this is the appearance of it. This is the two eyes. This is the dacryocystocele. Another image of that. This is here a bilateral dacryocystocele. And this is a dacryocystocele that is not only bilateral, but contains some low level echo with some debris or some polyp formation. And this is the 3D rendering of it, the other 3D rendering. And on uh, the video clip, you can see the lesion right next to the eye and the bilateral lesion on both sides of the nose here. Here we can see the newborn, the lesion is over here, the lesion is over there, and the treatment for that is very simple. It is just a matter of pressing with the thumb and squeezing the fluid down to the nose and rupturing the valvovastener. So this is what I wanted to show you in this uh, uh, two segments. I hope that I have rekindled your interest in uh, uh, tumors and that in the future we'll try to uh, be more precise than just saying large brain tumor or large facial tumor and be able to put a correct diagnosis on the issue. Thank you very much.